started a new series last week entitled The Journeys of Jacob. Jacob is one of those characters in the Bible that we read of that uh, gives hope to the rest of us, right? We think, if this guy can make it, I have a chance. And, you know, you read about some people like David and Paul and these people, and, you know, so many of them, you feel like, well, they make so few mistakes. Jacob's one of those guys. And a choice between the wrong way and the right way, almost invariably he'll choose the wrong way even when he doesn't have to. Um, this morning we're going to look at an unusual story. And I've entitled it, The Journey to Character. You know, sometimes we make journeys, but one of the most important journeys that we make is in our own mind. And that's where the journey to character takes place. We may have examples from the families that we were raised in, and sometimes those are good examples and sometimes those are bad. But then we make choices where we choose for ourselves what kind of person we're going to be. Let's read the text this morning. It's found in Genesis chapter 25, verse 29. It says, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom means red, by the way. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. There are no heroes in this story. <laughs> And we see two different journeys to character where we can say only that one is slightly better than the other. Esau Esau, as we said last week, was his father's favorite. He was his firstborn, even if it was only by seconds. He was the firstborn. The custom in the land at that time was that the firstborn child received a double inheritance. In other words, if there were two children, you would divide the inheritance into thirds and the oldest child would receive two-thirds, and the youngest child would receive one-third. All older children think, well, that's a good idea. All younger children think, well, that stinks. But there was a reason for there being that inheritance, and that was it was the responsibility of the firstborn to care for their mother. And that was the way the extra provision was given to provide for their mother. 
So that was the norm in the land. And then we come upon this strange situation. Now it's obvious that Rebecca and Isaac are nowhere in the story, and so therefore many people think that what we're dealing with is that Jacob was operating a camp a distant camp where they were taking care of the flocks and that Jacob was the one in charge of the camp and all of a sudden coming out of the wilderness is Esau and Esau is tired he is weary and hungry and he's just wants a meal And when his brother offers him this strange thing, and again, that's why I say there are no winners in this story, because his brother sees him at a disadvantage, and Jacob says, sell me your birthright. Now, we see the first choices of character this morning in Esau, And that when he's weary and hungry, he chooses food now versus blessing later. In other words, there's no, hey, I will sacrifice today in order that I might have more tomorrow. That's just not in Esau's makeup. Esau is the epitome of a person who is in the now. I live in the now. Tomorrow is meaningless. All that matters is today. And all that matters today is, what do I want? And so there's no restraint in Esau. There's no idea of holding back. There is no idea of, there are things that are precious in my life. And so in Esau's mind, he says, I'm so hungry. I could die today. And if I'm dead, what good is the birthright? Well, it's like this. If you're at the point where one meal perks you back up, you're nowhere close to dying. But Esau is at that point where I want what I want, and I want it now. He would fit very much in the modern generation, where everybody wants everything that they want, and generally they want someone else to pay for it. Esau is hit with a bill and paying something, and he thinks, it's not doing me any good today. So, hey, I'll sell it. Now, what's interesting is that, and this tells us about the character of Esau, he treats what is special with contempt. The last verse here, it says, thus Esau despised his birthright. That literally means he's treating it with contempt. In other words, doesn't mean that much to me. It's not special. I see a lot of people sometimes in the church who treat the grace of God with contempt. Oh, all that matters today is what I want, what I feel like having. And again, we see this carried on throughout Scripture over and over again. And it's amazing how many important and powerful people, even kings, would treat the promises of God with contempt. They would treat the instruction of God with contempt. So this teaches us that one of the first steps in developing character in your life, in a journey to character, is that you've got to understand that there are things that are more important than the material needs. 
that we think we have to have. Sometimes we think, oh, if only I have this and this and this, then I'll be happy. Have you ever noticed that you're not happy? Dave was talking in the offering about losing the new smell of his new car. We all can identify with that. There's a cheap way to replace it. They have air fresheners that are called new car smell. But you see, we look at that and we think, now I'll be happy. And we won't because material things will never make you happy. It may make you happy for a short while, but they're always going to come out with something newer, something better. And it gets old, and it starts to tear down and wear out, and because that's just what life is like. But there are certain things in life that we have to understand are precious. And sometimes, and like Esau here, it's an accident of birth. You're born into a certain family that's going to give you certain rights and privileges. You're born into a certain situation that gives you access to things that other people may not have. Again, do you treat that as something precious or do you hold it in contempt? And say this is meaningless. It doesn't matter. Esau is a total washout. There's nothing good ever said about him. <clears throat> in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews will refer to him as a profane person. Why? Because, not profane because of his language, but profane in the sense of all he cared about was what I want now. There was no discipline in his life. There was no putting off till tomorrow because I want something today. Then we come to Jacob. Jacob First of all, he looks for every advantage in life. We're going to see this is a pattern of behavior that he's going to follow for most of his lifetime. Jacob never does anything for free. Jacob never does anything whereby he can... Uh, not see some way of getting an advantage for it. He's the proverbial, help the little old lady across the street and hit her up for a loan on the other side. He doesn't do anything without a plan, without a scheme, without an idea of how can I make this work for me. And so Jacob, and we see it here in this situation. Do you notice what's taking place here? He's bargaining with his own brother. His brother comes in. He's tired. He's weary. He's hungry. What's Jacob? And it's not, hey, bro. I got a nice bowl of beans over here. I'll sell it to you for $10. No. It's like, I know Esau. I've got him right where I want him. He's vulnerable. He'll do anything. Things don't matter to him. I want, my, I want your birthright, buddy. And I'm going to sell it to you for a bowl of beans. I don't care how hungry I was. 
I've never seen a bowl of beans that was worth that. We're not even talking about steak. We're talking about a bowl of beans. And he's thinking, oh, I've got to have this. And Jacob is here. He's starting off with the deal making of his life. And he's liking, you know, I don't know if he was willing to be bargained down. We don't know because Esau is so dumb he just gives in to him. But it's like, I want to maximize and get everything that I can. Even people that teach you the different things about deal making teach you that it, one of the things that you want in making a deal is that you want the other side to feel a certain bit of satisfaction. It's okay for you to get the better of it, but you want the other side to feel good about the deal as well. Jacob has not been to that class. Jacob has not learned that lesson. And so what Jacob is going to live, leave in the rest of his life is he's going to leave a trail of people behind him who are going to look at him and say, I would not trust that person. I don't want to be around that person. It's like an old movie that Sheila and I like, uh, The Long Hot Summer, and Paul Newman plays a, a con artist type character in there, very much in the line of Jacob. And one person is talking about doing a business dealing with him, and he says, well, when you go there, don't wear any clothes so that when you come back, you won't feel the draft. And that's the reputation that Jacob is choosing. Because it's not, he's got to have everything. He doesn't leave anything to the own. We see this. This is his own brother here. There's no compassion. There's just, I've got an easy mark. Esau will fall for this. It's not the normal sibling rivalry of where you would think oh never mind i was just seeing how far you would go no notice here he makes him swear makes him go through all the legal formalities of it so that it's going to be binding he bargains with his own brother he's choosing his character Now, there's only one thing positive here in the story of Jacob. And that gets back to the question we dealt with last Sunday, and that is where God says, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. You know, the question is not why did he hate Esau. It's obvious why he hated Esau, because Esau doesn't care about anything special he doesn't care about any of the spiritual promises he doesn't care about any of that the question is always why does God love Jacob because Jacob is not that worthy but there is one positive aspect it's small it's tiny but it's amazing how sometimes God can take the little tiny things in us and God will water those and God will cause those to grow and God will put us in situations where the things that he sees in us that are potential and the potential for being good God will sometimes bring that to fruition and that's exactly what he's going to do in Jacob's life he's going to take one little seed of hope and God's going to nourish that what is the positive thing about Jacob he seeks for a better future Jacob's looking for some, a better tomorrow Jacob has a belief that Tomorrow 
can be better than today. And that sometimes I need to make sacrifices and sometimes I need to give up what I have now in order that tomorrow may be better. And that's an important spiritual principle in the development of character. And we see that and it's what we hope to instill in our children. It's sort of like, you know, when you send them to school, you want them to learn, hey, you know, it's more advantageous if you spend less time playing and more time studying. Even though playing is so much more fun today, if you spend that time working and you spend that time studying, tomorrow may be better for you. This is... You know, it's not the most important lesson in life, but it is a very good lesson. And so we teach and we train our children like that. My two boys worked with my dad for a while in the summertime, and they would be out there in the hot summers of Georgia in the 90 to 95 degrees and about 90% humidity, and they would work all day and hang in gutters, and they would come home and they would tell me how rough it had been. And I know what they wanted. They wanted me to say, oh, poor Paul, poor Daniel, you had it rough today. Let me comfort you. Let me fix you an ice cream cone or something like that. I don't know what they were looking for. What they got was some fatherly advice that they didn't care for at the time. I told them, oh, good, remember that next year when you're in school. Because if you don't study hard, that's your life for the rest of the life, your life. So you go for it. Because it takes character to seek for a better future. And that's the one little glimmer of hope that we see going on here in Jacob where Jacob has a possibility. Because what he's looking for, and this is interesting how God sees something more than what we see. What Jacob is looking for is, how can I get better than my brother? How can I get better than my family? How can I get more stuff for Jacob? And so Jacob is looking at it as purely material things. You know, some people try to preach this passage and try and say, well, you have... Jacob is concerned about spiritual things and Esau is just concerned about material things. No, they're both concerned about material things. The difference is Jacob wants his material things now. And, I mean, Esau wants his material things now and Jacob wants his material things later. And he's willing to give up a little bit now so that he can have more later. That's the difference between the two of them. However, what God will do is... Teach Jacob that not only can you get more material things tomorrow, you can get more spiritual things tomorrow. See, here's one of the great things for us to learn, and that is that God sees more in us than we see in ourselves. God sees the possibility I can do something with you now what's instructive here is as long as you have the attitude of I just want what I want today and that's all I care about there's not a whole lot God can do with you because all you care about is now all you care about is today all you care about is what I want now and it doesn't matter I'm willing to pay anything to get what I want now. And so Jacob is looking for a better future. That brings us to the birthright. The birthright can represent some very important things. And for us, what it represents are these. It, first of all, it represents the word of promise. The Bible is full of wonderful promises that God has given to us. 
we look at it and we see over and over throughout the Old Testament and known into the New Testament, we have this thing called covenant. And we read that word, and covenant is where we are making promises and God is making promises, and we're entering into a covenant relationship. Now, the problem is we in our modern society do not think in terms of covenant. Even though occasionally we use that word, we don't think in terms of covenant. We think in terms of contract. Now, a contract, and the way that we use the word contract is, a contract is binding until I don't want it anymore. Or until I can get a better lawyer than you got. And so we think in terms of contract, and what most people are looking for in the terms of contract is, I have a contract and it's good until I want something better and then I don't want it anymore. We see it all the time in these ball players. Sometimes they'll have a very they'll sign a five year contract and then in the first year they have a really good year and all of a sudden they say, I want to renegotiate my contract. Now it's amazing that when they have a poor year and the team has to pay them for a whole year and maybe they were injured and they couldn't do a thing that year. They don't talk about renegotiating then. Have you ever noticed that? The only time we renegotiate is when we say, hey, I deserve better. And that's not the way covenant works. The way covenant works is, co when I make a covenant, in the Old Testament, when we made a covenant, and there's a great example in, in Abraham, when God made a covenant with Abraham, and that was, what they did in those days, they didn't have lawyers, and they didn't have documents or anything like that, they would have a, what they called a covenant ceremony. Now, the way they had a covenant ceremony is they took certain animals and they would kill those animals and they would literally cut those animals in half and they would, put, they would lay the carcass, half of it over here and half of it over here. And then the two parties to the covenant would walk on the bloody ground in between and they would walk back and forth. Now, you think, well, that's dirty and messy and all that. Yes, it is. But it, it was getting across a very important point. Because when you made a covenant with somebody, what you were actually doing was you were saying, if I violate the terms and conditions of the covenant that we make, then you can treat me like these dead animals. In other words, you can literally kill me. And you have a legal right to kill me. And we couldn't operate that way in our society because there'd be a bunch of dead people. Because we don't treat anything with that kind of respect and commitment. What's amazing, though, is God does. God has made covenant with us. The final example of that covenant, and literally it was part of it, is Jesus Christ shedding his blood for us on the cross. That is the sign and the seal of the covenant. And that covenant is the birthright that we have as believers. And so the covenant represents the word of promise. Now, what this story illustrates to us is that we can live for today and lose the promise of tomorrow. I don't know if you realize this or not, but when Christ saves you, when God saves you, he wants certain things to happen to you, including, guess what? He really desires and wants to bless you but then we get hung up on things because we think well yeah god's got this promise of blessing me but i want what i want today and it's amazing how many believers will give away precious promises for just a few Simple sins. It's amazing how people will squander a future because 
They want what they want today. Paul went to school with a young boy. I believe his name was uh, Timmy Smith. Fantastic athlete. I watched him. I'd heard so much about him, I had to just go watch him. As a ninth grader playing high school football, he set the county record for the most yards gained for a ninth grader. Colleges, I'm talking about major colleges like University of Tennessee and different ones, came and started talking to him then. I went and watched him one game as a sophomore. He scored six touchdowns that game. He played offense, he played defense. It was like watching a Bo Jackson or Herschel Walker, or some fantastic athlete. He was, as a 10th grader, it was like watching a man playing with boys. He had such athletic abilities. He had such speed. I watched him. If he got even with a line, he was gone because he hit another gear that nobody else on that field had, and he was just gone like that. Fantastic athlete. Do you know he never played a down of football after his 10th grade year? Not because he was injured. Not because of a tragic accident. But because he thought, hey, I want what I want now. And so he got involved in drugs. I looked at it, it was obvious. He was a, he was a person he could have easily have been an All-American in college. He could have easily had a career in the NBA. He threw away literally millions of dollars because he wanted to get high today. I talked with a friend of mine who knew his family. And they said, well, he got it honest because his daddy was the same way. And you see, sometimes we make decisions today that throws away so much tomorrow. Not realizing God wants to bless us. The problem is we think, I've got to have that blessing now. I've got to have that blessing today. Instead of understanding that God says, I want to bless you. But the blessings always come in God's time. Or, we can live at an expectation for the hope of grace. We're all going to go through tough times. And our character says, I'm willing to do it God's way. And when you're willing to do it God's way, what that's going to look like is something like that. That means that when you're dealing with problems and strife today, when you're dealing with things and you're dealing with shortcomings, you understand that God has given us this wonderful thing called grace. You know, grace is a lot more than just for salvation. Paul talks about this in his letter to Titus, and he spends the whole second chapter there talking about, and he says grace brings salvation, but grace does so much more than that. Because it also teaches us how to live today. And what that looks like is, that means that when you're having an especially hard day and you'd like to give in and you'd like to just give in like Esau did and just say, I don't care any more about tomorrow. God gives you the grace to say, I can do it. When you don't have it within yourself, that's what grace does. Grace is that supernatural ability to do the things that we ought to do. That's what was missing in Esau's life. He wasn't willing to even try because he didn't care. 
But when you care just a little bit, you can ask God for grace. And God's grace is sufficient in any situation. And that's one of the most powerful things that we have in our day-to-day living. We have God's grace. And God's grace allows us to get through the hard and the difficult times of life. But grace does much more than that even. Paul goes on and he says, grace teaches us to look what he called the blessed hope. The idea that I'm not living this life just here, but I'm living this life in the expectation that there is a life to come. I'm living in expectation that I'm going to face judgment one day. I'm living this life in the expectation that I'm going to face God one day. And I'm living this life with the idea that grace teaches me that there are good things to come. And some of the good things are going to come in this life. And some of the good things are going to come in the, in the far distant future. Now the wonderful thing is that God gives us grace all the time. All we have to do is just ask. As I said here, we have the journey to character. Character is defined by some people as how you act when nobody else is looking. What's your decisions? Another person said character is how you treat people when you know they can't do anything for you. How do you treat those people? Character. Sometimes we're going to face moments of character. Jacob and Esau faced their moments. Esau got a F, Jacob got a D. The only thing you can say about Jacob is he did pass. So much more. You know, as much as Jacob is going to be blessed, and God's going to choose to bless Jacob in his life because he's looking at, man, that's all I got to work with. Do you think Jacob's life might have been a lot easier if he'd have said, Esau, you're hungry. Let, here, eat. Get full. No, he makes the choices that he makes, and Esau will eventually decide, you know, the best goal in life I can have is to kill my brother. That's what I will live for the rest of my life. I sold him his I sold him my birthright. Let's see what he can do with it while he's dead. That's his attitude. Character. I cannot emphasize to you enough the decisions that you make will affect you. The decisions that you make in life are going to affect you in a host of different ways. If you leave behind a trail of bruised and battered people in your life, and there are some folks that are like that, you can just watch them and all they know how to do. I've seen some people who use people up because they think, oh, I found someone that will be nice to me and they're almost like a sponge. Let me see how much I can suck out of them. Character, folks. Character. Make the right choices. Do the right thing. The book of Psalms would say it like this. Blessed is the one who swears to his own hurt and yet does it. Sort of like what my dad did one time. He told me, he said, Here's a great lesson that I learned because he miscalculated on an estimate when he was working on a building project. And he ended up, he told me afterwards, he ended up basically working for about a dollar an hour because he miscalculated. He did the job. He still did the same quality. But it taught him an important lesson because he told someone he would do it for X amount of dollars and he did it anyway. Character, folks. Character. We all will make that journey. 
and we will make that journey many times in our life, we need to make sure we're using the same principles and the same ideas that God would have us to do. Jacob didn't do that. He had a little sliver of promise. And God will take that and develop it. But because of the choices that he's made, Jacob has chosen a long and a hard and a difficult road because of his choices. If you learn to make the right choices early, there are a lot of hard roads you can avoid. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings that you've given to us. God, I just want to pray, Father, especially for those who are young among us. I pray, God, that they would learn to make the right choices in life early. That they would learn the value of doing the right thing. That they would learn the value of following after you and leaning upon your wisdom and trusting in you and putting their hope and their promise and their faith in you. And God, let all of us learn from our mistakes, from our failures, from our difficulties in life. Let us learn. We pray and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As you know, during the service, we allow you to text questions in. And the question is, why did Esau despise his birthright when he was father's favorite? Because his father wasn't there to protect him. And again, that's the importance of character because the people that you think, oh, I've got to end with them and I can do anything that I want and get away with murder, they're not always around to cover for you. And that's what happened to Esau in this particular situation. His daddy wasn't there to say, go ahead, Jacob, feed him. Okay. In Hebrews, is the mention of what Esau did in the context of giving up on the promises of God because of troubles. Um, now, the context there is giving up on the promises of God because of selfishness. Because he wanted what he wanted. In other words, he didn't, all that mattered to him was today, not tomorrow. And so it was like God saying, you're treating uh, something precious here, you know, literally, you're treating it like a bowl of beans. Okay. Was he called Edom because he wanted to eat um some stew? Ah. Uh, I suspect Paul Dickens is at work here. <laughs> Uh, he's called Edom because Edom means red. He, he was partial to, red was evidently his favorite color. He was red coming out of his mother's womb. He was called red all of his life. And evidently when he saw that red stew, he thought, oh, I got to have some of that. So anyway, that was good. <laughs> all right, Brother Dan.